Sir, good evening, uh, uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan, sir. Uh, good evening, Dr. Chandrasekhar. How are you, sir? <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah, I, I, I saw your uh, the uh, CV. It was so impressive. <laughs> you should come down to Chennai and uh, Stanley Medical College and give me a talk <laughs> when you are coming down to Madurai. Or at least sure, 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 sure. I keep on coming, yeah. Uh, it's very much impressive. <laughs> like, Hi, yes, Raman Krishnan, nice sir. Too. Very good ah, evening. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Good evening. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> good, good, sir. <laughs> ராமகிருஷ்ணனுக்கு <laughs> 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 பையன் <laughs> 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 Anyhow, the medical side is also not very rosy. So, so there's not, nothing to complain. I'm going to go to poetry games now. I'm going to be busy. I'm going to be totally busy. I'm going to be 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 busy. Everywhere, everywhere, the people are shortage. Everywhere, everywhere, the people are shortage. Everywhere, everywhere, the people are shortage. That is the shortage. Everywhere, everywhere, the people are shortage. Chandra, how many people are starting? ஆதா சார் ஒரு கப்பல் ஆஃப் मिनिट्स ஷால் வி ஸ்டார்ட் சார் ஆ சார் இன்ட்ரோஸ் பண்ணுங்க சார் உங்க கிட்ட ஃபுல்லா டீடைல்ஸ் இருக்கு ஆ எஸ் சார் எஸ் சார் நான் இல்ல இன்ட்ரோ듀ஸ் சார் மேபி இன் அனதர் 1 मिनिट வில் ஸ்டார்ட் சார் யா ஷூர் கேன் ஐ மீன்வெல் செக் தி ஷேர் ஸ்கிரீன் லைக் இட் ஷட் பீ ஓகே சோ யா யா டு ஸ்டார்ட் ஷேரிங் தி ஸ்கிரீன் சார் ஆ செக் பண்ணுங்க மாமா நோ ப்ராப்ளம் அனிதா கேன் யூ ஹெல்ப் சார் டு ப்ரொஜெக்ட் தி ஸ்லைட் ஷூர் ஷூர் சோ சோ वी ஹேவ் ஆல்ரெடி गिवन சோ தி ஆக்சஸ் சோ சோ கேன் ஷேர் இட் डायरेक्टली யா It's okay, na? It's like seen. Yeah, it's seen, sir. Okay. It's moving. Okay, fine. Shall we start, sir? Kanan, sir? Yeah. 
Yeah, we can start. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of Cardio Metabolic Congress, like uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all for this uh, Cardio Metabolic updates. So we'll be having a monthly Cardio Metabolic uh, update uh, as a pre-conference webinar uh, on different subjects. To start with the cardiology, followed by diabetology and renal medicine. So at the uh, by August 10th and 11th, we'll be having our third edition of the Cardio Metabolic Congress. I welcome you all. And uh, today's uh, webinar, like almost uh, close to 400 people have registered and we expect more people to join. And uh, there are a lot of people. It's a good response from the uh, uh, the uh, delegates. I uh, once again congratulate everyone and uh, wishes you all a happy learning. And today to start with, like uh, we are going to have uh, two lectures. So to begin with, uh, Professor uh, S. Ramakishnan, who is a renowned cardiologist from uh, AIMS. Uh, who is going to talk on the uh, the approach to the uh, the cyanotic congenital heart disease? And it's my pleasure and proud moment to uh, introduce Professor S. Ramakrishnan, who is known to everyone. is a well-known uh, cardiologist uh, from Ames, Delhi. He has graduated his undergraduate from Madurai Medical College. Later, he did his MD in uh, King George Medical College, Lucknow. And he has joined the Department of Cardiology Ames uh, as a senior resident in 2001. Later, he got promoted. Now, presently, he is uh, the uh, professor of uh, uh, cardiology in the Department of Medicine in Ames, New Delhi. So, very impressive to see that like he has published uh, close to 250 publications uh, in indexed journals. And his papers have been cited for more than 7,000 times with the H index of 30. So, it's a... Uh, Proud for it's uh, proud for all of us to have with us uh, Professor uh, S. Ramakrishnan, and he has authored many books and uh, chapters in various uh, the cardiology books and the recipient of various awards, including a DP Basu Award, Nanda Award, Sujay B. Rai Award, and uh, various uh, Karl Chopra Award, Young Investigator Award, and he has been uh, the member, uh, honored member, and. Uh, uh, a fellow of American College of uh, Cardiology, European Society of Cardiology, and so on. And he has done a lot of works, and uh, particularly uh, in uh, STEMI, ACT, involved in various trials also, rheumatic uh, study. And uh, he also holds the Limca Book of Records for measuring BP in almost 1.8 lakhs in a day. So it's, uh, again, a, a proud moment for all of us to have uh, Professor S. Ramakrishnan, who is going to talk about the approach to the uh, the grown-up congenital heart disease, particularly on the cyanotic part of it is going to dull now. Over to Dr. S. Ramakrishnan. Please, sir. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar, and uh, thank you, Dr. Kannan, and uh, the, um, the core group of this uh, meeting. And it's a, it's a wonderful to see 400 people registered and more than 100 people already joined by the time the webinar starts. It's, it's a rarity nowadays. Uh, I think thanks again, once again, for the opportunity. Uh, it's a it's a kind of an offbeat topic, uh, uh, kind of a, like a approach to cyanotic congenital heart disease in adults. Uh, unfortunately, in India, uh, we still see a lot of unoperated children or, or adolescents with uh, congenital heart disease. Whereas this becomes a, almost a rarity or almost unthinkable in the West, uh, and maybe some of the West, some of the southern parts of the country where the operation rates are improving. I think more and more patients are getting operated in time. And now we are more often than not seeing the consequences of a surgery that includes like a, a top repair related severe PR and all those things. For the sake of postgraduates and the sake of the uh, younger colleagues, I want to keep it as a mixer of the practice oriented approach as well as a clinical approach. So, so what is the, I will, I will pose some questions like, uh, so what is the most common congenital heart disease at birth? Is it tetralogy of fallow? Is it transposition of great arteries? Is it total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage or single ventricle? You can post your answer in the chat box. So is it is it one, two, three, or four? Just put it put the numbers. So like uh, these kind of questions are an interesting way of interaction and uh, make uh, drill the point that we want to drill. Uh, majority of you are going for tetralogy of fallow, which is what everybody thinks. But in reality, uh, it is not tetralogy of fallow. The most common congenital heart disease at birth is transposition of great arteries. And in fact, retrology of fallow will be uh, the number third reason for heart failure, for cyanosis at birth. So number one will be transposition of great arteries. Number two will be hyperplastic left heart syndrome. And third will be tetralogy of fallow. 
So why why are we not seeing them? That because these transposition physiologies, the first year, one year survival rate is twenty percent only. So whereas uh, uh, the the hypoplastic left heart, the one year survival is only ten percent. So that is why when it comes to adults, we never see any of these conditions coming up to it. So in terms of coming to adults, what is what are the common defects that are seen in adults with cyanosis? So we can classify it variously, but this is a very useful classification where you think of a common defect with expected survival. Those are only two. That is TOF and Eisenmenger syndrome. Uncommon defects with expected survival, those are Epstein anomaly and PS with intact ventricular septum and ASD. That is valvular PS or infant developer PS with ASD or a PFO shunting right to left. That is so-called triology of fallow. In the earlier era, it used to be called as triology of fallow. So these are the ones that are uncommon defect, but expected survival is there. So because PS... Uh, even with RV dysfunction, they keep on surviving life. So uncommon defect with exceptional, the defect is also uncommon. The survival is also exceptional, holds true for vast majority of conditions, including uh, your TAPVCs, the, the double outlet ventricle, transposition physiologies, univentricular heart, truncus arteriosus, and tricuspid atresia. So basically, commonality of the defect and what is the expected survival, that is what determines which lesions we are likely to encounter in adulthood. So having said that, there are some exceptional survivors that have been reported. So maybe this is a few year old slide. I have not updated. Maybe some more the publication would have come. So these are the unoperated patient survival that has been reported to date. So for example, CCDG is 91 years. CCDG unoperated with cyanosis live, can live for 91 years. So, so coming to the approach, what are the million dollar questions, especially in the examination or whenever you see a patient with cyanosis, the million dollar question is, in an adult is either it is TOF or is it Eisenmenger syndrome. So how do you make up your mind without before going for an echo? So how do you make up your mind? It will be depending on the quantum of cyanosis, how much is the cyanosis, how rapidly the cyanosis evolved, and is there history of spells in childhood, and is there history of squatting? So this is what are going to differentiate different forms of whether it's retrology physiology or Eisenmenger syndrome. So generally, tetralogy are more bluer and the blue tends to progress. Whereas Eisenmenger syndrome, especially the simple Eisenmenger syndromes are relatively less blue. The, to the start with the Eisenmenger syndrome, uh, they are they're mild or moderately blue. By the time the end stage comes, they also can become terribly blue. Having said that, some of the complex Eisenmenger syndrome can have really blue to start with. So spells, we know it's typically a feature of tetralogy and squatting episodes, even though they are considered almost a feature of tetralogy can occur rarely in Eisenmenger syndrome also. So what about the onset of cyanosis? The onset of cyanosis gives you a good clue about what lesions are likely to be. So if you have a birth to one week of life, you have then generally it's all critical diseases like uh, TGA, pulmonary atresia. These are the two common things that we all encounter, HLHS and obstructed TAPVC are the ones that we commonly encounter. Rarely you can have PSD, pulmonary atresia are a critical tetralogy and Epstein's anomaly also featuring in. But by this time, we go to one week and two months. The TGA and pulmonary atresia is again the most common thing and TOF comes up and up. Then HLHS goes down. Then few months to few years, it's TOF, TAPVC and balanced physiologies and trunkers. But beyond first decades, it's TOF, TOF, TOF. Then you have Eisenmenger syndrome, Epstein's and some balanced physiologies. Whereas beyond third decade, it's going to be TOF, that is, anybody coming with cyanosis later, then it has to be ASD with Eisenmenger syndrome, or it can be single ventricle with PS, or it can be CCTJ, that is, corrected, congenitally corrected transposition of great arteries with VSD PS. So, not only that, presence or absence of cyanosis, uh, the history of heart failure, history of failure to thrive, hemoptysis, history suggestive of a tachycardia because of a pathway. Uh, our uh, history of syncope, all those things can give you some clue towards from the history itself what lesion is likely to be. So these are all more towards cardiology features and I will skip some of them. So how do you approach a simple tetralogy physiology? What are the differential diagnosis? How are you going to deal with it? So that will be what I'm going to discuss with. What is a tetralogy physiology? For definition, there are four components to tetralogy. But what, are the, what are the physiology means? It's an unrestricted VSD. That means the VSD is unrestrictive. That means the right ventricle and the left ventricle pressures are the same. And there is significant severe pulmonary stenosis. And this is leading to streaming, right to left streaming, and that is producing central cyanosis. This is what is typical tetralogy physiology. So it falls in the group of 
cyanotic congenital heart disease with decreased pulmonary blood flow. So the physiology is generally a right to left shunt happening at the, the ventricular level or at the aortic level. So how do the history of tetralogy is like? So tetralogy tetralogies at rest or at crying or activity, generally in adults, it's always prudent to check excise desaturation. So 25% of uh, children are, are uh, neonates of cyanotic at birth and 75% are cyanotic by one year of age. The late appearance of cyanosis is due to progressive increase in oxygen demand of a growing child, increasing PS because of PS begets PS. And after birth, there is a slow change from HbF to HbA, which is a better carrier of oxygen. Generally, tetralogy patients have normal uh, weight gain and growth. Squatting is generally a good feature of uh, tetralogy. Squatting increases the SVR and diverts the RV blood into the PA so that P increased blood, blood, permanent blood flow increases. More importantly, squatting decreases the venous return from the leg and the splanchy saturation, which has some of the lowest oxygen concentration. But having said that, it is also reported in 3 to 10 percent of Eisenmenger syndrome also. Many of the adults, once they reach adulthood, they don't report classical squatting. They report a lot of the squatting equivalents, which is like dead, uh, sitting with legs drawn for drawn words, legs crossed while standing. Uh, all those things are possible. Cyanotic spells are generally is a future of six months to two years. Generally, it occurs around six months to two years in early mornings. Having we we know cyanotic spells for ages, but we still don't know the exact pathogenesis or the mechanism of uh, uh, cyanotic spell. So there are various theories that have been put forth. So the most common theory is the infant development goes into spasm with crying. So that's a very simple theory that, okay, whenever the patient cries, whenever there is tachycardia, whenever there is demand, sympathetic activity is there, the right ventricular outflow tract constricts and that further reduces the blood flow and patient becomes cyanotic. But having said that, the BSD pulmonary atresia also develops, that there is pulmonary atresia, there is no anti-grade flow, till they develop cyanotic spell. So how do you explain that? For that, we need to have different theories and these are the various theories that have been put forth. So we don't know. So for the postgraduates in the group, I will just briefly touch upon what is the typical auscultation and clinical findings in tetralogy. So I used to teach tetralogy means no clinical finding. So in general, JVP is normal. And in adults, it can be, A wave can be prominent. The, there is no cardiomegaly. The cardiac size is normal. There is no heart failure. Everything is no. There is no personal impulse. And there is systolic thrills are uncommon. Even S2 is single. Even S2 is not also two. And there is generally only a short, soft ejection systolic murmur, which is also inversely proportional to the degree of cyanosis or the severity of tetralogy. Okay. So why this is because inversely proportional? Because it is produced at the RV outflow region. It is it is it is at the uh, the PS level. So so whenever the PS becomes more, the pulmonary blood flow reduces. So the less pulmonary blood flow, the patient is more cyanose, the less is the murmur. And the diastolic period is very clear. There is no S4 or S, S3. And these are the various differential diagnoses of tetralogy, like physiology, which you can encounter. A simple thing will be a VSD with PS, or it can be a double outlet right ventricle. You can have a tricuspid atresia. You can have TGA. You can have corrective transposition. You can have AV canal defect. You can have single ventricle. You can have heterotaxy. So I won't be boring into this, but for the for the people in the, uh, the PG students, some of the very important features that you have to identify in clinical examination will be whether the apex is LV type of apical impulse or an RV type of apical impulse. So if you find an LV type of apical impulse, tetralogy means it's a right ventricular hypertrophy. RV has to be the impulse. But in a tetralogy-like physiology, if you find LV, that means the, the RV is useless. RV is diminutive. So what are the conditions in which RV becomes diminutive? That is in tricuspid atresia, in some of the single ventricles of LV morphology, or uh, in uh, in Epstein anomaly and PA with intact ventricular septum. That is pulmonary atresia with intact septum where the RV is gone. The functional RV is less in Epstein anomaly and PIVS is a, it's a form where there is pulmonary atresia with intact septum, the RV is diminutive. So these are situations where in cyanosis you can find the LV effects. These are the two commonly found differential diagnoses of tetralogy like physiology with uh, LV effects is tricuspid atresia and single ventricle. So these are the various other things that you find a valvular regurgitation murmur. You should think of uh, AV canal defect and character transposition. If you find a, a murmur of PR, you should think of absent pulmonary valve. If you find complete heart block, you should think of character transposition. And uh, especially character transposition is more common if you find discrepancy between situs and the, uh, the cardiac position. That means it's more common in situs solitus with dextrocardia, situs inversus with levocardia. 
So how do you approach it? Like, so some other conditions definitely will go for a single ventricle palliation. Some other conditions, two ventricle palliation should be possible. Two ventricle repair could be possible. So single ventricle, definite single ventricle will be tricuspid atresia. That means there is no tricuspid valve. Majority of the heterotaxis syndromes and only one single ventricle is there. Definitely single ventricle pathway is going to happen. But in rest of the situation, it all depends on whether there is adequate two ventricles are there, whether one ventricle is small or not, whether you are able to connect the LV into IOTA and whether the defect is balanced or not. This is what you have to see. In tetralogy, what is the typical survival rate? Survival rate is roughly around 65% in one year, 50% in five years, and 25% roughly in 10 years. That means two-thirds survive in one year, 50% survive in five years, and then one-fourth survive in 10 years. Even this is very bad. Because it's so common, still rest of them are terribly bad. That is why we keep on seeing unoperated tetralogies at this age. So hence, whenever even the patient is asymptomatic, any tetralogy, biventricular repair is possible, he should be operated upon. So what are the factors that determine the timing of surgery? When will you operate a tetralogy? So basically, it will be de determined by symptoms and cyanosis and cyanotic spells, anatomy, whether it's a two ventricle repair or a single ventricle repair, and some other situations where you need a conduit or not, and then the expertise at your center and associated lesions determine it. So what will be the management algorithm in a child with tetralogy-like physiology? When there is two ventricle repair is possible, that means corrective surgery is possible. We often go for a complete correction, that is intracardiac repair at six months to two years of age. Generally, if it is postponed to one to four years of age, if there is a need for a conduit. So if, if the patient presents with cyanosis or significant symptoms before the six months time, then generally a palliative procedure like a plalac toxic shunt is done. But nowadays, more often than not, we go for interventional therapy in the form of either a right ventricular outflow tract, that is REOT stenting, or rarely PDA stenting, that is ductus arteriosus stenting. So these are the these are the ways in which we manage. Generally, six months to two years, you go for total correction. Below, below six months, you want to go for a, uh, the patient needs an intervention, we go for either a palliative interventional procedure, or we go for uh, the, the total, the, the, the BD shunt. What is single ventricle pathway? Only one ventricle is there. What is the management perspective? Management perspective is we want that one ventricle to do only the systemic function. We don't want that ventricle to do the any of the pulmonary function. That means right ventricular function, we want to bypass it. So how do we do that? We initial stage, we connect the SVC, the, the SVC into the pulmonary artery. So that means upper body return directly goes into the pulmonary artery. That procedure is known as bidirectional Glen Chan. Then in the next phase, we, we connect the IVC blood also into the pulmonary artery. That we call it as a Fontan surgery. So in general, single ventricle pathway either needs a BT shunt, generally a Glen shunt at four months to one year, where we connect the SVC into the pulmonary artery. And in Fontan, we connect them into the IVC into the pulmonary artery also. So the whole body blood goes into the pulmonary artery directly without going into the heart. That is the Fontan surgery. So this is how it is done. So Whenever a patient undergoes a BT shunt, the patient is then goes for a Glen and then a Fontan. This is stage procedure. Rarely we go from BT shunt to Fontan directly. Or what about this algorithm in adults? Adult, two ventricular pathways possible, always ACR. Uh, only palliation if it is uh, not possible. Single ventricle pathway, shunt and Glen has very little load. And more often than not, we go for a direct Fontan procedure. So a brief mention about uh, uh, triology of fallow. That means the septum is intact. Here, you whatever I said is completely opposite of tetralogy. So the JVP will be elevated because it's it's intact septum. The septum is intact. So that means whatever RV hypertrophy is there, it produces cardiomegaly, it is reflected in JVP, it produces left parasternal heave, everything comes in. So it's a very good way to understand that these two physiology. That's why it's repeatedly asked in the exam. How do you differentiate between intact septum PS with us, PSD with PS? PSD PS, there's a big VSD, which is not producing so much volume or the pressure overload on the uh, RV and the RV is able to happily pump into either IOTA or pulmonary artery. Maybe the blood is goes less, less blood goes into the PS, but it is able to eject freely into the IOTA. So that is why there is no parasitic leave, there is no cardiac leave, there is no heart failure. Everything opposite happens. There is RVS3, there is RVS4. Here the pulmonary ejection murmur is proportional to severity and it is generally a late picking murmur and there is heart failure. So coming to heart failure, tetralogy per se doesn't produce clinical heart failure. These are the common conditions in which you will find a heart failure in tetralogy. That will include anemia, restrictive VSD, otherwise known as Hoffman variant. All these valve regurgitation associated like TOF with AR, TOF with PR, uh, infected with and TOF with TR. 
ventricular dysfunction is a common cause in adults and then you have surgical shunts collateral arrhythmia and hypertension and so on so moving on to the next common thing that is eisenmenger syndrome so this is a kind of a vsd that we still see at uh, especially in north india the patient was referred to surgery at 3 years of age the patient comes back after a few years with this x ray so same patient couldn't undergo surgery and now is clearly classically settled into an eisenmenger syndrome this clearly tells you what happens in eisenmenger syndrome eisenmenger syndrome the pulmonary vascular changes become irreversible and the qpqs comes down comes down comes down at some point of time the the right to left shunt starts and there is no cardiomegaly and the the excess flow is not there and the patient becomes cyanosed so these are the common conditions that can produce eisenmenger syndrome and then you have uh, this is another question that i want to break the monotony of a lecture so i want you to answer at what age a large vsd will eisenmenger because it's conceptually an important question at what age uh, 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 patient will eisenmengerize less than 6 months is 1 2 years is 2 10 years is 3 and the 4 year 20 years is 4 uh, so majority of you got it right majority were going for 2 uh, which is right so generally there is a pro some problem pro problem why we why we keep on asking this is like generally patient with eisenmenger presents to you in the second decade with uh, symptoms of exercise limitation but the process is a process it is not that one day the patient eisenmenger is and next to the previous day he was operable this kind of a process the patient goes from operable to borderline inoperable to borderline inoperable and then finally totally inoperable so kind of a process that happens and most of the patients the proportion of significant vast majority of patients are inoperable by around 2 years of age so but this can be earlier in 6 months and all in some kind of cyanotic with increased pulmonary blood flow or some syndromic associations like down syndrome so so generally uh, closing the defect beyond this time is generally detrimental it has a median survival of 30 to 40 years so this is how the survival matches with the eisenmenger syndrome compared to uh, uh, a typical iph generally eisenmenger survival is better uh, survival than iph but having said that 20% that is one fifth of all deaths in eisenmenger syndrome because happens because of an ill advised medical procedure or an ill advised activity including pregnancy so it's a, it's there our duty that to prevent a patients undergoing unnecessary procedures and unnecessary uh, surgery so i i used to teach like this there are three sub groups of eisenmenger when it comes to clinical presentation one is cyanosis since birth they they are like the very rare syndromic uh, like uh, tga with vsd or some complex eisenmenger syndrome that's extremely uncommon to encounter in adults but most commonly we find two kind of eisenmengers where there is classical history of failure to thrive uh, there is recurrent respiratory infection in childhood but then there is a later on a settled phase and then a symptomatic adolescent comes so this is this is roughly around the, maybe around the 40 to 50% of eisenmenger and the remaining also 50% roughly will be insidious presentation with no history of uh, 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 this kind of a history and then they just present insidiously with cyanosis so what are the classical features cyanosis is very variable jvp is rarely prominent in uh, a wave can be prominent and the heart is not enlarged uh, parasternal heave is variable p2 is loud and palpable in two third of patients ejection click may be found edm of pr in one half to two third and uh, s2 depending on the various uh, uh, anatomy what is the underlying etiology i'll come to that in later so there is generally minimal left parasternal heave and absence of significant shunt murmurs and the signs of ph tend to predominate that means there is a constant ejection click of ph and pulmonary regurgitation murmur can become operable uh, audible so this is how the x ray looks like classically asd eisenmenger you can say ra and rv enlargement and the pa is generally disproportionately dilated and there is cardiomegaly whereas vsd and uh, pda generally don't have cardiomegaly but you can have all the other features like features of ph with no cardiomegaly with la and lv enlargement previous signs of la and lv enlargement pda can have a prominence in the pda site there is a prominence in the pda site or there can be a telltale sign of previous aortic enlargement can be there so this is the other question which of the following clinical sign is unlikely in a patient with vsd eisenmenger syndrome uncomplicated single s2 palpable second sound cardiomegaly and absent parasternal heave
so most of you got it right so i think uh, most of you know this so i think this is i think one of the very important slides that you have to take home uh, the usual onset of uh, eisenmenger syndrome in a vsd is less than 2 years pda is less than 2 years whereas asd is generally 20 to 40 years differential diagnosis is a future of classical future of pda whereas cardiomegaly is a future of uh, asd uh, p2 is generally single in a vsd whereas pda can be normal or narrow split whereas asd still remains wide and fixed it may be Uh, narrower than previously, but nobody would have documented how wide it was before. So generally, it is still wide and fixed. That is, parasternal heave is there, TR is there. So generally, TR, cardiomegaly, parasternal heave are futures of ASD Eisenmenger syndrome, whereas PR is a future of PD PD Eisenmenger syndrome. So I'm not going to deal with Epstein because you know uh, because I can't deal everything in uh, uh, such a few time. But uh, if there are various arrhythmia that happen, it has lot of typical ECGs and so many X-rays that are there. But I will conclude my lecture with some common issues that are found in adults with CHD. Uh, that is, uh, there is there can be myocardial dysfunction due to hypoxia. There can be AV valve regurgitation that can worsen everything. And iotopathy, especially dilatation of iota, even after surgery, uh, is emerging as a major problem in these patients, especially resulting in iotic dissections, iotic regurgitation, and so on. Iotopulmonary collaterals are a major source of trouble, even intra-op, post-op, pre-op, everywhere. so they need uh, they can produce hemoptysis at any time and arrhythmias are emerging as a major problems in even post operative uh, both early as well as late complications and there are definitely at risk of infect endocarditis so apart from all this cardiac complication there are very many it's a multi system disease having cyanosis in an adult is like a multi system disease almost every part of the organ is involved because oxygenation is a primary thing every organ in the body needs oxygen So it it involves everything like there is polycythemia, anemia, hematological. There is a whole chapter of uh, uh, on uh, what are the hematological abnormalities in cyanotic renal artery disease. I can't go into the details. Uh, neurological there can be at risk of brain abscess, stroke, uh, cerebral venous thrombosis, hemoptysis. Uh, the renal uh, there are many renal issues, uh, and then there are a lot of other issues that happen which are poorly dealt in our country. especially pregnancy contraception advice non cardiac surgery advice employability insurability and psychosocial issues i think this is where we have, have to pitch in as a physician uh, make sure that they have a comfortable thing and then they have to be carefully managed so i will end, end with some two important slides one on what are the pregnancy outcome in cyanotic renal heart disease in overall this is a heart disease you can see the completed pregnancy is worst for cyanotic group that means pulmonary atresia with vsd the fontan even the post operative fontan group and the patients who are cyanotic and isen they are they have the worst completed pregnancy whereas the worst mortality data the, the most mortality and deaths happen in ph and eisenmenger syndrome so so pregnancy outcome wise the, the cyanosis is a key determinant of uh, oxygenation to the fetus and the fetal survival so generally anything below 85 any cyanotic renal disease is poorly tolerated in pregnancy generally Eisenmenger and PH situations generally are very badly tolerated by the mother, and they have the most high maternal mortality. And then you you have to always counsel a patient if the mother is affected, even they they have been operated. What are the chances of uh, the fetus getting uh, the affection is also another key determinant. And this is some of the highest will be there in Marfan syndrome. Uh, and then these are the various things and common thing that you have to understand is tetralogy is roughly uh, around two point five percent for mother affected and around all the congenital anomalies roughly around two point five if a previous sibling is affected. So this is a useful table that you have to understand. So so generally they should be offered a fetal echocardiography at a appropriate time. So I think managing an adult with especially unoperated adult with uh, um, cyanotic renal disease, you need a lot of clairvoyance because it's still uh, not a focused cardiology. It's still a whole ra range of medicine. They come with tuberculosis. You they you think of APC. They come with hemoptysis. Ultimately, turn out to be tuberculosis. You have to be a good physician at heart, and you have to be really caring in handling your psychosocial thing. Uh, adult with CHD approach is very simple because. Most of the time, ninety-five, ninety-nine percent of the time, it's either going to be TOF or TOF-like physiology, Eisenmenger syndrome, or Epstein's anomaly. So, it's, if you have a simplified approach, it will be very useful. And these are some of the uh, things that I would suggest you to go through. Uh, uh, very, very good, uh, useful textbooks that uh, uh, that deal with some of the Indian problems and uh, Indian things like. So, thank you for your patient listening. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shah. Very precise, practical approach. If I don't have disease, and now we will go on to the. Uh, if, uh, the other second is there.
Any questions from the audience in the chat box? I don't know if it's too far to this. I think the questions are there in the chat box. Most of the request is for the interaction. No, no, no. Any questions from the audience? Sir, there are a lot yes. of uh, questions in the chat box. Uh, there is a question. Shall we take some questions, sir? Some questions, sir. Yeah, fine, take some questions? Sir, yeah, sure, sure. Yes. Yeah, shall we take some questions, sir? A couple of questions. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for your nice uh, illuminating lecture, sir. So, uh, I think uh, uh, there are some queries also, like on it. I just read out some of the questions if there is anything. There are a lot of requests to share your PPT. <laughs> so, uh, there is. Uh, I Segmental think somebody approach. has asked something uh, for the... Segmental approach. Which book to read, they have asked. Segmental approach. I think I think any other fetal textbook, uh, uh, fetal echo, for, they are asking for a fetal echo. Fetal okay. echo, sir. They are asking yeah. for that. Yeah. Sir, there is yeah. another question. Why TJ is more common uh, than TYF and underreported? That is because uh, I think TGA is the most common. If you if you if you do an echo or if you analyze the data at birth, TGA is the most common cyanotic congenital heart disease. But as I said, only twenty percent of them survive one year of age, and hardly even not even one percent survive till ten years of age if unoperated. So that is why we don't encounter TGA in adulthood at all. They all die within one year. But it is the most common. We don't know why it is more common, but I I don't know. These are like yes, manufacturing there is one more question, like, sir. Uh, there is one more question. That is, the ASD patient with pregnancy, do you prefer any infected endocarditis prophylaxis? No. No, ASD in general, no infected endocarditis prophylaxis. And ASD is generally very well tolerated in the absence of uh, uh, any other complications of ASD like MR, MS, or, uh, or uh, PH, or uh, all those other things are not there. Generally, ASD is well tolerated. Uncomplicated yeah, ASD is some... well tolerated. Yeah, there are some questions like how to manage secondary polycythemia and cyanotic congenital heart disease. So it's 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 never a focus to do uh, phlebotomy as a as a therapy has been almost given up. It is only useful in patients who are absolutely symptomatic and you have no other option to do. They're there because uh, there only it is indicated. That means there has to be hyperviscosity syndrome that has to be there. And very rarely you generally end up treating polycythemia because most of the polycythemia that happens is it's a kind of a uh, compensatory mechanism. So it's a compensatory mechanism and you want to uh, leave it alone. But unless it's a really producing hyperviscosity syndrome, then you can follow the guidelines and do phlebotomy. And very rarely, yes. very few patients, we have put them on hydroxyurea when there is intractable excessive polycythemia. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, there is one last question. How early can you diagnose TYF in a limited resource setting? So it can be very easily diagnosed in fetal echoes by around 20 weeks or so. It can be easily diagnosed with accuracy at around 20 weeks, but maybe with experts around 16, 18 weeks, it can be suspected. Yes, sir. And anyway, I think all neonatal uh, age group, a baby is born, definitely you can diagnose a TOF. Having said that, there is one caveat that you may not find the same ROT gradient that you find in other patients in neonates. Yes, sir. Um, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, your, uh, so I just, I just want to address uh, one important point, which is very relevant to the way we will practice. So TGA is more common than TOF. Any important clinical findings so that we can diagnose early. That's a very, very important point. Even today in 2024, vast majority of TGAs born in this country are dying. They are not getting operated. So that is what the data says. So, so what we need to do is just do saturation monitoring. Because all these TGAs don't have any clinical finding. Nothing is there. Just before discharge saturation of all the newborns will pick up a lot of these TGAs. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your uh, uh, illustrative lecture on the approach to cyanotic congenital heart disease. Kanan, sir, would you like to say anything, sir? Thank you, Ramakrishnan. Very informative. Very practical, as usual. And thanks for the joining session. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. I once again, uh, Namaskar to Sir Narayan, sir.
who has been my teacher and guru thank you sir yes sir always good to hear your lectures always <laughs> something to learn from them <laughs> Yes, sir. Hello, Dr. Khan. I think Mr. we Master. can move. Yeah. Hello, hello, sir. Yes, Narayan, sir. Yes, sir. Welcome, oh. welcome. How are you? <laughs> fine, fine. Welcome, Narayan, all well, sir. all well. Nice to see you. Yes, sir. I appreciate. <laughs> Thank you. So, should yeah, I share yes, my sir. screen? Yes, sir. So, I think yeah, we can yes, move on. Ah, uh, yes, sir. I think we can move on to the next topic: the extra in uh, congenital heart disease. Uh, Kanan, sir, would you give a, would like to give you an intro, sir, or uh, shall I uh, go ahead? I think uh, we can go ahead with the lecture. And forget about the introduction. Yeah, then uh, I'll uh, give you a brief introduction, sir. He's uh, yes, Professor yes, Narayan yes. Uh, from Lucknow. Uh, he's a renowned uh, teacher, and uh, he's uh, 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 he's retired from uh, the KG Medical University, Lucknow. Presently, he's the director and the head of cardiology and a divine heart and multi specialty hospital in Lucknow. Uh, he has got 196 publications to his credit and he has written 23 chapters in cardiology books. And he has been the examiner for DM and DNB for, throughout the country in uh, many premier institute. And uh, uh, he has been, uh, has got a vast experience spanning over uh, four and a half decades from clinical to interventional practice. And he has got a special interest in clinical teaching. And uh, I request to Dr. Narayan sir like uh, to go ahead with... Uh, the extra okay. in congenital heart disease. Please, thank sir. You, thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar, for that kind introduction. And thank you, Dr. Kanan, for letting me in. And we will revise the x-rays together. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir. We are able to see, sir. Okay, Can so you I'll... move some slides? Yeah. So we go to malpositions. And so make it full size, sir. So make it full size, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Is it yeah, full yes. now? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yes, let us sir, start yes, with situs, and you look at the abdominal situs, and you look at the bronchial situs. So I think abdominal situs is more easily seen, where the gas bubble is on the left and the liver is on the right. It is situs solitus. When it is the other way around, it is situs inversus, and when you can't tell, it is situs ambiguous. The second thing you look for is the cardiac apex, whether it is on the right or the left, making it a leveover and dextrocardia. So here on the left side, you have a situation where there's situs solitus and the apex is on the left side, that is a levocardia, and this is a normal heart. On this side, you have situs inverses where the gas bubble is on the right and the apex is also on the right side, that is you have a mirror image dextrocardia and here also the anatomy is more likely to be normal. Now in this case, you have a situs solitus, but the apex is on the right side, that is dextrocardia, and this isolated dextrocardia and generally associated with complex congenital heart disease. Now, on the left, you have a normal situation. On the right, you have a situation where the situs inverses, that is, the gas bubble is on the right side, and the apex is on the left in the normal side, and this is isolated levocardia, once again associated with complex congenital cyanotic heart disease. Now, you have an X-ray when you have a liver sitting in the center, and you don't know whether the situs is solitus or inverses, then you call it a situs ambiguous. And it is generally associated with abdominal heterotaxy and with isomerism, whether or not the apex is on the left or the right, or it's ambiguous, you can't tell whether the apex is right or left, in mesocardia. In both these situations, you have a complex congenital cyanotic heart disease. Now, this is a situation where you have a bilateral right bronchus, that is right isomerism, and this is associated with complex congenital heart disease. Another situation where you have a bilateral left bronchus, that is a long and narrow bronchus, and the left bronchus on both sides, left isomerism, also associated with complex congenital heart disease. Right isomerism, generally associated with ASPDA syndromes, and the left isomerism is generally associated with polyspleens, and you have an interruption of the inferior vena cava with SI goes draining into the right atrium. So this is uh, the abdominal um, uh, situs solitus inverses heterotaxy, right and left isomerism, which you should be looking for in your examination and ask for. Now look at the PA view. What are the structures that you see here? Basically, you look at the trachea, which is in center. This is the area of the aorta. And below this, you have the pulmonary artery. And you look for indentation on the trachea. Indentation on the trachea is on the left side. 
this means that the aortic arch aortic arch is left sided now in this situation you find that the indentation is on the right side therefore it is a right sided aortic arch and you also look for pushing of the trachea on the opposite side if you have a right sided arch it will push the trachea to the left and form an indentation on the right side so this is a right sided aortic arch if you look for an indentation here you find that the indentation on the left side again a left sided arch and an indentation here on the right side means that the arch is a right aortic arch if you have an indentation on both sides it could be a double aortic arch where you have compression of the trachea as well as the esophagus now once we are talking of the aorta this is the ascending aorta and you see this dotted line and this is the descending aorta ascending aorta is prominent in cases of a bicuspid aortic valve and aortic stenosis because of the mesial abnormality in the aorta you have in now you don't get it so often in aromatic aortic stenosis but in bicuspid congenital stenosis you have an ascending aorta dilatation on the other hand if you have a dilatation of the main pulmonary artery this is classical for valvular pulmonic stenosis so this is pulmonic stenosis and this is aortic stenosis ascending aorta and main pulmonary artery so once you begin to analyze the uh, the congenital heart x ray start your interpretation with the pulmonary artery if the pulmonary artery segment is absent you are dealing with a tetralogy physiology if the main pulmonary artery is prominent you could be dealing either with pulmonary stenosis as eluded earlier or it could be pulmonary atrial hypertension and to differentiate between the two look for the right pulmonary artery if the right pulmonary artery is absent it is a case of pulmonic stenosis and if the right pulmonary artery is also prominent it is a case of pulmonary arterial hypertension now this is the angio to show the user so this is the pulmonary artery right pulmonary artery diminutive in a case of pulmonic stenosis and a prominent right pulmonary artery in a case of pulmonary arterial hypertension and the criteria for calling the right pulmonary artery prominence would be a rp rdpa diameter of more than 17 mm now just to give you an example if you have a case of cyanosis with cardiomegaly then look at the main pulmonary artery and the main pulmonary artery is prominent but the right pulmonary artery is absent therefore it is a case of pulmonic stenosis and if you have cyanosis it is a trilogy of fallow where you have intact ventricular septum and reversal through the atrial septal defect or pfo another case you have cardiomegaly you have cyanosis and you have a box shaped heart look for the main pulmonary artery absent look for the right pulmonary artery absent this is a case where you have functional even a true pulmonic stenosis as in a case with epstein's anomaly where you have this classical box shaped heart because of right atrial enlargement and rv outflow dilatation the third example of cardiomegaly with cyanosis main pulmonary artery prominent right pulmonary artery prominence clearly a case of pulmonary arterial hypertension and if the patient is cyanosed it is a case of eisenmenger and as was alluded by dr ramakrishnan earlier if you have cardiomegaly it is a case of asd eisenmenger if you have a normal size heart it is a case of asd or a pd eisenmenger now what is increased and decreased pulmonary blood flow increased pulmonary blood flow you divide the lung field into three parts and if you see vasculature down to the third part it is increased pulmonary blood flow and the main pulmonary artery segment would be prominent the other signs of increased pulmonary blood flow are these end on vessels these rounded shadows which you see over here and if you are able to see the bronchus also you compare the pulmonary artery end on vessel with the bronchus and it has to be larger to be called an increased pulmonary blood flow increased pulmonary blood flow occurs because of a left right shunt look at the aorta if the aorta is enlarged if the root of the aorta is enlarged it is either a rupture sinus of valsalva or aorta pulmonary build if the arch is enlarged it is a pda if the aorta is normal then if the right atrium is enlarged it is a asd or a papvc and if the left ventricle is enlarged it is a ventricular septal defect so here you have a case of asd main pulmonary artery prominent right atrial prominent and the aorta is diminutive so this is also an important sign so asd in a vsd you have a left atrium sitting here you have a left ventricle case of ventricular septal defect and lastly in a case of pda you have a main pulmonary artery prominent but the aortic arch is also prominent and sometimes you can see 
the PDA, the calcified PDA, so-called rain road drug calcification. So these are the three differentiating features. Another examples of PDA, prominent aorta, prominent aortic arch. So the three differentiating features would be right atrium and absent aorta in ASD, a left atrium, left ventricle and VSD, and an aortic arch prominent in PDA. If you have a case of right atrial enlargement, main pulmonary artery dilatation, you think of KST. But when you look at the ECG, you find that the axis is northwest in association with RVH. And if the child has these features of Down syndrome, you're classically dealing with an AV canal defect, which is confirmed on the echo, even on the MR. If you find an unusually prominent superior vena cava, you could be dealing with a partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection. And one example of pulmonary venous connection, which is most often given in the examination, is the schmidt syndrome, where you have a partial anomalous right uh, lobe drainage below the diaphragm and through the inferior vena cava. And this is a classical schmidt sign, which is called the schmidt because of the Turkish salt. So partial anomalous venous connection. Another example of a Turkish salt, a partial anomalous venous connection down below the diaphragm into the IBC. Turkish salt, schmidt syndrome. And this is the anomalous vein going down below the diaphragm to drain in the inferior vena cava, a 3D reconstruction to show how this is draining into the IBC. Now, the truncus is, gives you this picture of a right-sided aortic arch with increased pulmonary blood flow and LLP. So, truncus has to be looked for when you have a right-sided aortic arch because the right-sided aortic arch is most common with truncus. 33% of them will have truncus, will have a right-sided aortic arch. Now, from increased pulmonary blood flow to decreased pulmonary blood flow, you draw a line on the X-ray and you find that the vasculature is missing from the middle as well as the as the lateral field. So this is clearly a reduced pulmonary blood flow, and reduced pulmonary blood flow could either be because of tetralogy physiology or Eisenmenger physiology. Now, if it is an Eisenmenger physiology, the main pulmonary artery segment will be prominent. While if it is a tetralogy physiology, you will find that the uh, main pulmonary artery segment is absent, so-called empty pulmonary bay. So easily differentiated on the X-ray, whether it is top or Eisenmenger. The Eisenmenger syndrome X-ray with an enlarged pulmonary artery and a very, very prominent right pulmonary artery gives you this jung handle picture, classical for Eisenmenger VST, which is not seen, which, which you don't get cardiomegaly here, and you don't see a prominent aorta. So this is a VSD Eisenmenger situation. Now, in an Eisenmenger, you have another peculiarity, the so-called pruning of the vessels, where you have a prominent right, but in this right pulmonary artery suddenly tapers down and you don't see any vasculature either in the middle or in the lateral zone. So this is classical pruning of an Eisenmenger physiology. And this has also already been told by Dr. Ramakrishnan. In ASD, you have a right ventricle, a right atrium, and cardiomegaly. In VSD, you don't get any cardiomegaly. In a PD also, you don't get any cardiomegaly. But the aorta knuckle gives you a clue that this is a PD. Now, tetralogy physiology, once again, as told by Dr. Ramakrishnan, means that you have a large non-restrictive BSD and a severe narrowed pulmonary artery outflow, RV outflow tract, or severe BS, whether it is below or at the valve or a combination. And the anatomical uh, components of tetralogy physiology, I give you a mnemonic, 5 TDS. The 5 Ts would be tetralogy, D and the L transposition, tricuspid trees, and truncus type 4. The second D will be double outlet and the S would be single ventricle. Just remember for the examination, five TDS in tetralogy physiology. This is the classical X-ray for tetralogy. You have an absent main pulmonary artery and you have an upturned apex. Looks like a boat, the core and sample. Now, if you are diagnosing tetralogy physiology, but on the X-ray, you find that instead of the right ventricle, you have a left ventricle and the right border is straightened. You are dealing with tricuspid trisia where you have a left ventricle prominence and because of the juxtaposition of the appendage with a straightening of the right border. So right ventricular apex, tetralogy, left ventricular apex, tricuspid atresia. This is a very classical Mickey Mouse sign of absent pulmonary van in tetralogy where you have grossly dilated pulmonary arteries and this leads to respiratory distress and cyanosis in the newborn and you find that the heart is shifted to the other side because of the compression of the vein bronchus leading to collapse of lung and pulling of the lung to this side. This is not another Mickey Mouse sign. This is classical figure of eight, 
when the patient presents with cyanosis, continuous murmur, this is total anomalous pulmonary venous connection. The supracardiac grayness gives you a figure of it. The upper figure is formed by the vertical vein, the nominate dilated superior vena cava, and the lower part is formed by the cardiac cell. This is also called cottage loaf, also called snowman, and you have a snowman in storm, which means that you have a snowman sitting in the field of increased pulmonary blood flow. So this is, you know, these are various things that curiosity is a snowman in a snowstorm. Now you can get obstruction in the supracardiac uh, drainage also, but it is most common with infracardiac drainage of total venous pulmonary. It can get obstructed here at the diaphragm or when it drains into the inferior vena cava or into the hepatic. If we go through the circulation and there will be obstruction. And this will present as a ground glass appearance, gross hepatomegaly. And this is what you get on the X-ray in a patient who has total anomalous pulmonary venous connection with obstruction to the vertical vein. Now, the differential diagnosis of this kind of haze could be mucinous aspiration in the newborn. It could be highland membrane disease. It could be hypoplastic left heart syndrome too. And hypoplastic left heart syndrome is diagnosed basically, differentiate basically by the absence of the LV and a prominence of the right atrium. So you have a haze in the X-ray peripheral field. You have a right atrial enlargement. You have left ventricle absence, and this indicates hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Now, if you have cyanosis since birth, you are likely dealing with a tetralogy-like situation, with a transposition-like situation on the body, and you have an egg on side appearance. You have a narrow pedicle, and you have increased pulmonary blood flow. This is classical or <coughs> transposition of great vessels transposition that is complete transposition. Why do you have a narrow pedicle? The narrow pedicle occurs because you have an anterior posterior relationship of the great vessels and your thymus is absent. Now this is what a normal thymus would look like. You will have two signs, the sail sign and the the, um, the I'll tell you this is the sail sign where you have this sail. This is the thymus looks like a sail here, another sail sign and then you have the wave sign where you have this wavy thymus on the, on the borders of the heart. So these are the two signs, which are the normal thymus, the wave sign and the sail sign. And this is a hugely uh, dilated thymus. Which So if once the thymus is absent, you see these anterior posterior vessels sitting one after the, below the after against the other, and you have a narrow pedicle. So when you compare the X-rays of tetralogy and transposition, transposition will have some cardiomegaly, will have a narrow pedicle and there will be increased pulmonary blood flow. You see this increased pulmonary end on vessels. While in the tetralogy, you will have a right ventricle, upturned right ventricle, and the main pulmonary artery segment is absent and the blood flow is reduced. So blood flow is increased, blood flow is reduced, cardiomegaly, no cardiomegaly, and an RV index in both situations. Now, if you're diagnosing tetralogy of fallow, but when you look at the X-ray, instead of the absent main pulmonary artery, you get this prominence on the left border, but this is not the pulmonary artery. This is a L-transposed aorta, which is arising from the right one. So the right atrium is connected to the LV, the LA is connected to the RV, and the RV is connected to the aorta, the <coughs> LV is connected to the pulmonary artery. So there are two wrongs, and two wrongs make a right. So this is the left-sided aorta, which you're seeing on the X-ray, and gives you this classical picture. So this is the right ventricle, trabeculated right ventricle, connected to the left-sided and transpose for the aorta. And the question often asked in the examination, what do the catheters look like? So we say that in L transposition of great vessels, the two catheters, the arterial and the venous, will not cross. While in tetralogy, the two catheters will cross. So this is how this is asked in the examination what the catheters would do in a tetralogy versus L transposition. So if we compare all the X-rays, this is RV, absent main pulmonary artery tetralogy. Cardiomegaly, egg on side, narrow pedicle increase, pulmonary blood flow, detransposition, no cardiomegaly, it reduced pulmonary blood flow, but a prominence on the left border, L transposition. And instead of the RV, you have an LV sitting here and you have a straightened right border. This is once again tricus with atresia. And when you look at the echo, the normal echo will show a circle and, and saucer. The circle and sausage appearance, not saucer, this is commonly whispered as saucer. It is circle and sausage. This is the sausage, this is the circle, this is normal related great vessels. This is tetralogy where you have a normal circle and sausage and you see the trabeculated just below the pulmonary valve. So this is tetralogy. 
Now, if instead of a circle and sausage appearance, you get two circles, it is transposition of great presence. And if the aorta, which is anterior, if it is on the right side, it is detransposition. If the aorta is on the left side, it is L transposition. So this is normal, this is tautology, and this is transposition. If the trans if the aorta is on the right, it is D. If the aorta is on the left, it is L. So just five more minutes to go before I finish. This is coaptation of aorta, which you should be able to diagnose. And this is the classical three sign which you get because of the dilatation of the subclavian artery and the posterior dilatation of the aorta. If you see it on a bearing meal, it gives you an E sign. Otherwise, on the X-ray, it will give you an E sign. But the most important sign is you have notching of the ribs. But the question often asked is, why don't you get rib notching on the first two uh, intercostals? Because they are arising from the cervical trunk. And so if you get a prominence will only occur when you connect the vessels above and below the stenotic area. If you're connecting vessels both above the stenotic area, you will not get prominence. So the first two uh, intercostals are spared. It is from the third and eighth downwards that you get this notching. And this is the classical notching which you see on the inferior surface of the ribs. The posterior ribs will show you this inferior notching. These are the this is the rib notching, and this is the sign P sign. Now there is a differential diagnosis of this notching also often asked in the examination. It could be Takayashu, it could be classical BT, it could be severe vena cave obstruction, could be fistula, AV fistula, and even neurofibromatosis. So the differential diagnosis of rib notching. And uh, you have you know bilateral and unilateral all sorts of questions you can read in the books, but this is an X-ray to show you beautifully the rib notching on the inferior surface. And the rib notching is because of the prominence intercostal muscles. This is the internal memory. These are the intercostals, and they are connecting to you know dilate because the supply has to go down the aorta beyond the obstruction here, and therefore they become prominent. And you see them. You can even feel them on the back clinical examination. Of course, you can see them on the X-rays of rib notching and on a CT and you like what I've just shown you. So with that, I think I need to end my talk here and thank you all uh, for your patient hearing. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. A fantastic talk as usual, uh, Professor Narayan. And uh, very simple, very lucid. We'll just take some questions from the uh, our uh, chat box. Most of them is just appreciation of the wonderful talk. And uh... I think it's a very good lecture, sir. I think you Thank have thrown a lot of uh, 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 interesting x-rays. Like uh, uh, I recollect my old and uh, the uh, postgraduate days, like uh, where our teacher used to say, the figure of eight and other things like uh, so you uh, give a uh, given a very illustrative talk with uh, the uh, with uh, how to make a clinical diagnosis uh, radiological diagnosis of a congenital heart disease it's a very good lecture sir we are uh, fortunate to have you with us today and uh, kanan sir would you like to give a concluding remark sir is there any questions sir we just see the questions as one person has put a small doubt post tof repair svt patient how to treat or how to identify in the earliest stages? post uf repair SVT. How to treat and how to identify in early stages? SVT will be treated as usual. I and mean, I don't think there is any uh, difference in treating this SVT in, in a tetralogy fellow with a vis vis Because SVT, I don't think, is very common after top, is it? Because you have arrhythmias, ventricular arrhythmias, which are more prominent. But if you get an SVT post repair, it is going to be treated as. As, as you would treat any other SVT. I think uh, if there are uh, any more questions, so we'll just wait for one minute. And uh, yeah, I think uh, it was a fantastic lecture, uh, Narayan. Thank you, sir. And, uh, and uh, excellent. And many of them have asked for upload in YouTube, which shows that many people have really appreciated your lecture. And they're extremely yeah. You can do so that if you have my recording. You can do that. You can so upload it. What the request has come, and it's very, very, very for more, more than it is very pleasure to see you after a long time. And <laughs> so, thank you, thank you so much. And uh, thank I think you, sir. another thank second you. can thank conclude. After, yeah.
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. We are immensely pleased to Thank have uh, the uh, two great stalwarts with us today, to uh, uh, Dr. Professor S. Ramakrishnan and Professor Narain with yeah, us. Ramakrishnan and was and with I thank all the GSA. delegates also who joined. For his MD, yes, Dr. Yes, Ramakrishnan was there with us for his MD here in uh, his yes, So that is the time we met. And oh, great to know, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, thank you, sir. Thank you. I thank all the delegates for, for joining with us. And uh, we'll see in the next edition of pre-conference webinar next month uh, with another topic, uh, preferably on diabetic uh, subject like we'll give uh, uh, two, topics. We'll take two topics next month. And I thank once again uh, all the uh, delegates and uh, faculties and uh, my team, Professor Pai, especially Professor Kanan, sir. Thank you, one and all. And have you a nice week. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir.